Okay, we have made it. Episode 100. It's about to be on. I've got a great one here for you. I've got Keith Belling from Right Rice, and I've got Kevin Mulrain Pro Quo. Welcome to the show. Hello there, Mark. Thank, thanks for thanks for having me on. I'm excited to be here, and I can't believe I get to be part of Show 100. This is this is going to be a great one. Uh, a little bit of, of history. Uh, Keith and I know each other. He's an amazing person. Uh, I'll give a backstory just real quick. Had a previous venture. I, I connected with Keith because he's here in the Bay Area. We met actually multiple times. He gave me his time uh, and wisdom uh, multiple times. So big love, Keith. Big love. Ah, thank you. You're a good listener. A very good listener. <laughs> now, Let's talk Right Rice, but before that, give us a little glimpse of what you did prior to Right Rice with a, a small brand we know as Pop Chips. <laughs> well, I am your classic serial entrepreneur, which basically means I decided early on to make myself unemployable. And I and I actually, it's been fun. I've been involved with a number of really interesting companies and brands, and you know, sort of I go back to the internet world. Which, if you're a San Francisco entrepreneur, you had to do an internet company, and we did one called AllBusiness.com, and Look better lucky than good. We sold it just before the bubble burst. Um, my next fun adventure was Pop Chips, which, you know, we launched in 2007. You know it well. Obviously, you've become uh, quite a guru in the snack world, but it was, uh, you know, really one of the funnest brands I've ever, you know, any funnest businesses I've ever been involved with. I mean, we really created something special. I, I think we got to sort of redefine the snack aisle and really lead the, what has become this mainstay of better for you snacking. And it was an incredible learning experience. And probably the best part I'd have to say about it is, you know, not knowing what you don't know when you go to do something. Um, Cause I went into a snack aisle, as you know, that's, you know, dominated by Frida, who's got an 80 plus share. And, you know, had we, you know, and we really went in just with a fresh perspective, and did it our way. It was an incredible opportunity. And then that led, um, you know, we, we that led to, to Right Rice, which is what I'm doing now. When did that start and how did you get the idea? What, what did you see was, was, you know, what many call as a void in the category and why did you go after that? So you mean right rice? Correct. Yes. So, so look, I started pop chips for a very simple reason. I was eating too many Doritos and I thought that there had to be a better tasting, healthy snack. And at the time there wasn't, now there's lots of great choices. And in the case of right rice, um, you know, look, I love rice. I found I was eating a lot less of it because of all the empty calories and the carbs. And, you know, when I, when I went out to the market to see what was there, I, first of all, I found myself cutting way back on one of my favorite foods, which is white rice. And when I went out there to see the alternatives, there really wasn't anything there. I mean, cauliflower is a fantastic vegetable. It's not a very good rice. It doesn't perform like rice or taste like rice. And so when I saw there wasn't something there, again, not knowing any better, you know, I, I just dove into it and came up with a way to make a shelf stable grain of rice that actually, you know, looks and tastes like rice and has lots of protein and fiber. Everybody knows I'm big on balanced nutrition. Uh, so it, it just so happens some brands and our products sort of speak to me. So when I saw it coming and I said, OK, this is going to be a fun one. Um, I'm, a, I'm a believer in it. And um, I understand all the aspects that it can do for the body and, and everything else. I also like the comment about cauliflower. Um, I don't know if everything is subjective when it comes to, to, to foods, but um, I'm, I'm also, I have the same sentiment as you. I, I wanted it to work uh, in, in some of the ways that I, I wanted to fill different areas. Uh, and for me, it's the same thing. It just didn't. Um, so uh, I, I understand that, that sentiment. What is the first thing that you do, even though you had all the experience, just anybody that let's say wanted to go into a specific category, what was that first phone call that you made uh, as far as wanting to produce a product like this? Well, first of all, every product as you know is different. I mean, look, had I stayed in the snack aisle and done another snack, I, I probably wouldn't have had to need quite as much help, but the rice aisle and the, and the, and the center of the store is very different in so many ways. And so the first thing was, how do we create the product? And the second was, you know, things like how to bring it to market and develop it. And, and in my case, you know, really my first call, there's a guy who had worked for me um, at Pop Chips, who is an incredible R&D talent. And I had this idea, it was a bright light that went off, an epiphany in my mind about the, oppor about the opportunity. And I called someone who was really experienced and he loved the idea from day one. And within no time, we were on the phone with the co-packer figuring out how to develop the product. 
Talk about co-packers uh, again, because you, you've done different things. I think Pop Chips is is unique because it, it was a, a pure innovation. So that's kind of a separate story. Um, but in, in this case, are you there like as, as a founder, are you sitting there? Are you walking in the in the co-packer or manufacturer's office and, and sort of walking through how is this going to get done and, and, and providing some guidance there? Or are you just sitting there as somebody, as, as a student, as they would say? Give us a kind of perspective on that. Well, uh, look, a, a little bit of both. I mean, co-packers are always important partnerships. You know, uh, Pop Chips, we, we bought a manufacturing business, so it was unique and it, and it worked out well for us the way we did it. And in the case of Right Rice, you know, no, we didn't want to be a co-packer. But in fact, there was a group that had worked for us in the past that I went to as the co-packer. And it was a, it was very much a collaborative effort. I mean, it, it took nine months to develop the product. It was, you know, very complicated coming up with the right blend. I mean, as you know, we blended lentils and chickpeas and green peas and a little bit of rice to come up with it. And we went through, you know, 10, 20, 30 different variations, um, you know, of the blend to come up with what really hit on, you know, nutrition, taste and cooking um, for us and the things that we really wanted to do. And it was a very collaborative effort. So we learned from them and look, we pushed them and pulled them in directions and they became investors in what we're doing and have really been fantastic partners. That, that's a that's a bonus all, all around. Um, as far as the, the taste test, when you're doing iterations, are you, this is again, for those that are watching, you know, early stage, we, we often, you know, have, have the product and we taste it ourselves and maybe you give it to, you know, your mom and your sister and your brother, you know, but your best friend, but are you a believer early on? Do you take the product and get it out into the hands of multiple people? Or do you feel you have the sense at this point to just know and understand what a product should be like taste, texture and the like, uh, as far as, as far as the launching it? So, so the short answer to that is I'm not a fan of focus groups. Um, I, I, I personally think that in most cases, the consumers don't know when things are new and really what they want and don't want. So I'm a little reluctant to rely on focus groups. Sometimes for pure flavor, you can do that. But for a product like this, we did not rely on that. But having said that, it, by no means do I just trust myself and do no means do I go to just those closest to me who are going to love anything I do. I mean, my mom, bless her heart, would have loved anything I gave her to try. But what I do is create a very small group that I socialize ideas around. And whether that's product, taste, and texture, or brand design, like I'll have a very good tight group of people who I really trust, who have very different points of view, who, by the way, all of them pride themselves on being outspoken. So I want people that are going to share a point of view. I may not agree with it, but I want a real point of view. And I don't want people who are just going to say, oh, this is fantastic because you did it. Fine people are going to keep it very real with you. I, I have the same sentiment. I, by the way, I always love those posts about your mom and stuff. It, it, it hit home. Uh, and and uh, my, you know, anyway, um, I know what the feedback and what they would and wouldn't say and stuff like that. So um, as far as finding those people who are going to keep it as honest as possible because they understand what is on the other side. That nobody, you don't need to hear what you, you know, you need to, to, to you know, what you want to hear, right? That that's not going to create yeah. any success on the other side. Um, you know, getting that hard, honest truth, whether or not you agree with it or not, is a good one because at the end of the day, it's your call. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's just something that people should 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 you know put in the, in the playbook. Yeah, you want to. I, I, I would just I would just, yeah. I would just say, Josh, you want to be challenged, right? But at the end of the day, the buck stops with you. Well said. Well said. Uh, talk about distribution out the gate. When you first uh, launched, did you go specifically into a regional or did you have some big retail plays and did you throw it on the website first for some early testing or was it all at once? So let, let me kind of give you the pop chip side and the right right side. So when we did pop chips, and by the way, I'm a big believer if you have the right product and you can get away with it, you should find a really significant, what I call flagship retail partner to launch your brand. And depending on the product and your capabilities and manufacturing, that could be regional, it could be national. It really depends. Um, in the case of Pop Chips, we launched in the Western US with Safeway. That was our launch partner. Hmm. We were really lucky. Um, keep in mind, I mean, I you know now I have done something. At that point, this was my first food product, but Safeway loved it and retailers love something new. They want to be first to market. They really like that. Safeway actually wanted us to launch nationally from day one. And, and I just said, no, that's not realistic. We, we just can't do that. So we launched in the Western US, which was a huge coup and it got us a lot of instant credibility. 
in the case of right rice, you know, we weren't looking at quite as much of a mass product as, uh, you know, as, as pop chips was for Safeway. We thought we wanted to really kick the product off in the natural channel. So in, in this case, we went to Whole Foods. We went to them early. We had great conversations. We had a fantastic buyer. Um, Christina, if you're listening, it's been amazing working with her for uh, two and a half years now. And she loved the product that we launched with them. We launched nationwide, um, which again is no small feat. You know, we've now launched three product lines in two and a half years with, um, with Whole Foods, each time nationally. And when I say that's no small feat, when we did Pop Chips, we never had a single national launch, not one. We, we built ourselves in Whole Foods region by region. Um, and so I, I know how hard it is to get a national launch. So anyway, we, we did national launches with Whole Foods, great launch partners, really got us to be able to kind of get the product out to the marketplace and start to grow from there. Walk us through in, in that specific aisle during, uh, I'm not going to name it, but March 2020 and, and some months thereafter, what did that look like? Was there an immediate pool? Was there an immediate you know, sort of demand? And how were you able to scale that uh, quickly? Well, first of all, fortunately, we had a really strong supply chain and we were able to keep up with demand through COVID. Um, and, uh, and, and I, you know, we were, we were, you know, Better lucky than good. We sent lots of pizza and beers to our uh, Copac uh, partners, their teams, to keep them on track. Um, and and look, uh, look, their pantry loading was obviously a huge thing. So during that period, and we had a big rush in demand, you know, both at Whole Foods and at uh, and on Amazon. And we had actually, at that point, were you know had had launched Right Rice both with it, with Whole Foods and Amazon. In fact, but anyway, we had a we had a really good presence, and you know the biggest boost to our business was Amazon as a lot of brands found during that period. And, and I'm really amazed we managed to keep up with, with the demand. Um, it was pretty incredible. And, but look, people generally were looking for pantry staples and pantry favorites. They weren't really looking for new brands and products. You were rushing into a store and you were grabbing what you, what you liked and what you knew. And so in some cases, actually the discovery of right rice was we were the last products on the shelf. You know, in a lot of cases, I mean, the things that were staples like, you know, Ben's Original or Lumberg, you know, everybody knew those brands that had been buying them and we were new. So when people came up and wanted rice, they grabbed them. And we got great messages from people who said, oh, my God, look, I grabbed this bag of this stuff called right rice. I had no idea what it was. And I remember a woman from Portland sending an email saying, oh, my God, I love it now. I buy it all the time. So. It, it, it was an interesting, uh, an interesting thing to go through. Yeah, if that's the way you got trial, uh, you know, it is what it is. And, and, and that's what happens. Uh, walk us through we're, we're now summer 21. What is the business look like? Just uh, frame it for us. You know, how many people are on the team uh, distribution wise and sort of, you know, size of, of, of the brand and, and where you want to take it, let's say in the next 12 months? So first of all, very small team intentionally, um, unlike Pop Chips, again, was my point of reference where I had, you know, three, four years in, we had 90 people plus a manufacturing team. So we built a really big team with field marketing, you know, regional field marketing folks and so on. Case of Pop Chips, we have, I mean, I'm sorry, of Right Rice, we've got, you know, really 10 people, including me, a small handful of contractors, you know, and, and we've outsourced all of our finance to Propeller, who are amazing partners. Um, and look, as far as the brand and the business, you know, the, what we focus on is we focus on sort of, you know, everybody says this these days, an omni-channel distribution strategy that, you know, drives synergies across sales and marketing. But in, but in our case, we really think about that a little bit differently. We think about kind of two key focuses. One are what, I, what we call brand building channels. You know, these are kind of where emerging brands go to get built and discovered. There are things like specialty, e-commerce, of course, and food service. You know, so we're really focused on places where people can discover the brand and also drive revenue. So it's almost a subsidized marketing. So when I talk about food service, for example, we launched nationwide, system-wide with Kaba restaurants. And so we're in all the restaurants as the chicken and right rice bowl or as an alternative base, all branded. So we've had hundreds of thousands of people in their hundred plus restaurants since we launched buy right rice and discover it through that. So that's a great discovery channel. So I call those sort of brand building channels. And then obviously juxtaposed against that is traditional retail, you know, which is super important, of course. That's where brands go to scale at the end of the day. But it's really the synergy between those two that are most impactful. And from the um, retail side, you know, look, we're, 
you know, we're at, we finished last year at about over 7,000 doors, you know, just over two years in, you know, um, we're at all the traditional folks you'd expect, Whole Foods and Kroger, Safeway Albertsons, HEB, Sprouts, you know, kind of across the board. But we really look at that synergy of what I call the brand building channels and, and traditional retail. And look, we have, you know, as far as how big we are, you know, we have a great footprint, this beachhead and retail and our emerging channels. Um, and, you know, we, we last year did, you know, over $7 million, which is our second year. And, you know, this year, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have, we'll see some really solid growth once again. Very cool. I didn't know you'd kick out the numbers, but I, I love that. Um, I mean, it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's better. If people share it, 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 it provides context. It, the, the whole idea behind this is value. And, and what's nice is uh, in the 100th episode is, is having you as somebody who's experienced it. And, and I, 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 I am certain you'll say this, but the sentiment is you're always learning, right? It doesn't matter because everybody, if you don't know how big Pop Chips got built, it, it's a big, big brand. Um, and getting now into something new, it, it, yes, you've carried over all the things that you went to war with, right? You know, all those learning experiences. Like I say all the time, like, I can't wait to, to see what I look like in 10 years, 20 years, if God allows that to happen, right? Because you're just, you're just, it's an arsenal, right? You're just putting in the, in your backpack, um, because you've got to constantly be learning, especially in CPG. This is such a difficult business and yeah. brand building is difficult and there's moving parts all over the place as far as advancements in all different things, not just at retail, physical and e -com and how consumers are finding you and where and why. And there's just a lot going on. So give us that, that you know, in closing, like what your feel is for those starting or those that are 10, 15 years into this thing. Well, look, I, I think you said it really well, Mark. I mean, we're always learning. That's probably the first thing I would say. I'm very intellectually curious, so I love to learn. And that's a lot of what drives me to do new things is to learn. But look, every product, every channel, every part of the store is really different. And they're all challenging. I mean, anybody who says things are easy and successful is, is, is either truly a unicorn or not being honest. Um, I love when people have businesses they sell after 10 or 15 years and they call it a 10 or 15 year overnight success. Um, but look, the, the way that I think about it is you learn as much from your failures as your successes. Um, you learn more from your failures than your successes. And, and that's definitely the case with me as well. We have things that have worked better than others. And at the end of the day, no matter what level you're at, I, I think the most important thing is to surround yourself with smart people. You know, get some people around you, whether it's your team, your advisors, your board, all of the above, you know, that are bright, that are passionate, that have a point of view and listen to them. You know, again, you don't have to agree. You oftentimes won't agree, but you really want to listen. You want to challenge your thinking like we talked about earlier. And then you, you make some decisions and move forward. But really having smart people around you, whether you're doing your first or your fifth venture, whether you're a startup or established, I mean, it's, you know, we, you know, we're, we're all much smarter together than we are alone. Love all that. Such a great way to close that one out. Keith, thank you so much. Uh, that was a gem. Uh, Kevin, let's talk pro quo. Give it to us. What's it all about? Yeah, no, and I, I think this is a great segue because, you know, the, the difficulty in building a brand and, and growing a brand is exactly why we exist. We are a brand management platform. Uh, we know that there are millions of decisions that a brand can take to grow. Um, and so what we want to do is help brands grow with certainty, um, whether you're looking to increase market share, increase your distribution, recruit non-users. Um, essentially, brands come into ProQuo, you tell us your goal, and we give you a custom action plan on how to achieve that. And we do that through understanding people's feelings towards your brand, your competitors, and, and even what they desire and what they want from the category. Um, we talked about walking down the chip aisle, right? And, and so many decisions are made based on feelings and not thoughts. So we analyze feelings and we tell you exactly which actions you need to take um, to achieve your goals. So we're working with over 200 brands in a wide variety of different industries and categories, um, helping them you know, be more confident and see more positive outcomes from their marketing investments. Well said. I like that. Uh, yeah. Kevin with ProQuo. Uh, Keith with Right Rice. Their info is around here. 100th episode in the books. Appreciate you both. Have a great week. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it, guys.